I think you're all ready uh, for the first uh, speaker. Um, the first one is Sarah uh, Joseph uh, Burke, and she's actually, she has been a service designer uh, for 15 years at the NHS, the National Health uh, Service from the UK. And she will talk about uh, how you can manage your position as a service designer in an organization that is uh, maybe not used to uh, working with service designers. So I'm very curious about that. Uh, at the moment, she's uh, working at an agency which is called Love by Design, also in the UK. So uh, I would be happy to uh, get her on stage if she is ready for that as well. I'm seeing some messages in our backstage uh, chat that we are still looking for her. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, we are still trying to connect with her in our uh, backstage chat. Okay, shall we do a little uh, Q&A with ourselves, uh, David? <laughs> yes. <laughs> are there any particular uh, talks that you're looking forward to today, Stina? Yes, I am. Actually, the first one uh, I'm really interested in because I noticed that we are uh, more and more also moving into organizations that are maybe not used to um, really implementing uh, design in their uh, workflow and that we as service designers get a very uh, important role in that. They uh, were often training um, clients as well, and I see a big future for us, so I'm super curious to um, which struggles she had to um, overcome, and I'm sure we can learn from that. Yep. What about you? Um, well, one thing I am looking forward to as well, the, the 10 years of uh, service design jams. I think it shows how much history there is to, uh, to service design. Um, and I think it has evolved over the years. And I'm sure uh, Marcus uh, and uh, Adam will be able to tell us a lot about the evolution in the last 10 years. Um, let's have a quick look to see if our speaker is ready. Sarah, are you there? Not yet. Okay. Then, what are what do you think our biggest challenges would be, David, during this online um, conference? What will you well, miss the most <laughs> compared well, to a live apart conference? Apart from the, the challenge we we have at the moment, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's the the interaction, of course, um, the chats in between when mm -hmm. having coffee. But I'm also looking really forward to how. The Brella tool is going to fill that uh, that hole from a physical conference. Um, I've had my first uh, uh, requests already to to meet up and to have chats. Um, so I, I really look forward to seeing how that works. I think it's interesting to have the the one on one interaction through Brella, which mm -hmm. is something I really enjoy at the real conferences. How about you, Stina? Yeah, I also already got some meeting uh, requests. I didn't manage to uh, to reply them uh, yet, but maybe it's something to encourage to everyone. Uh, you can um, tell um, people what you would like to talk about uh, using the Brella tool, and then uh, please uh, try to connect to people that you maybe uh, haven't uh, spoken to before. It can be uh, an interesting uh, challenge for everyone to try at least once. To, uh, to connect with someone. Indeed. So, while we're here, I'm going to take the opportunity to also say thank you to the entire uh, organization team, uh, especially Jasmine. I know uh, you've done a lot of work to get us online here at the same time, all uh, interacting with each other. I think uh, that's a good, great job, and thank you very much for that. Have a quick peek. Still some technical issues going on on her end. Maybe already a question to the audience. Uh, who dares to use the Q&A uh, section first? How about uh, immediately asking us uh, a question and then we can uh, see how it will uh, work for the talks, the upcoming uh, talks. Yes. What is a question you want to ask the service design community at large? <laughs> Uh, 
I think one interesting question from my end is, yeah, the, the interacting with people physically is so important in service design, uh, communicating, bringing people together. Um, and we're, we're seeing that it works really well using online tools like Miro and Mural. Um, I'm wondering what are your wonderful insights? What's working better today than it was uh, before the, uh, the online days? Oh, I see some questions popping up. The first one is, how long have you been doing the podcast? <laughs> um, that's been almost five years, I think, by now. Yeah, um, is it? Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we've been, I think, almost at five conferences, uh, walking around with our microphones. So it's been some time. Not mm -hmm. always the most, most frequent, but uh, it's been five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see a... Uh, Another question, what metrics, outcomes are important to senior leaders from service designers? Who, I think that's a question we need to ask uh, the speaker. Uh, <laughs> interesting question. I also see some of you found the upvoting um, function, which is really nice. Could we have, can have this uh, test before the real talk? Any other questions coming in, Stina? Let me check. We have um, people asking what chances are we will be having a um, live uh, conference in Denmark next year. Let's hope we can. <laughs> I think, yeah, if we all work hard at the moment and uh, <laughs> keep things from escalating that's very hopeful that that the conference can go on indeed mm -hmm. i see um, also a question which is about any tips for students who are here i think it's great if you manage to join as a student um, one tip for students, if you don't know them yet, but maybe for everyone as well in the community, uh, is to check if there are any local chapters in your neighborhood, people who uh, will be organizing events. Um, we also host a Belgian one together with some other agencies. And uh, I can say there that there's always some super interesting um, okay. interactions going on. Stina, I see that... Ooh. Uh, our speaker is there. Uh, yes, so, Sarah, someone. people around the world, give a big round of applause <laughs> for Thanks. Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I'm really sorry. I'm in Australia in a quarantine hotel as we speak. I've had no sleep. So, please excuse me as I share my slides with you. On this one. Okay. Sorry. So, can everybody see? I'll just keep going. Yeah, good. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so, I wanted to call this talk um, really very much. Um, patience inspiring me and sparking change in me and I'll preface the talk by saying that essentially I'm not with the NHS anymore and that this is all just my observations and my work within this particular setting. So to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sarah and before I became a service designer I worked in mental health for about 15 years. Um, and this was really, really important for me because what it did was it enabled me to work with the whole person and really know how important that person was to any kind of change process. So as an occupational therapist, you were never just interested in one thing um, and people were really complicated. And that gave me a real interest in how we could make services better that would meet their needs. And then what happened was in 2015, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
Uh, and I share this slide because this was so important in my life because this was a time when for the first time I needed all those parts of the service to work for me. And I had never been a patient in this way before. And really that was a fundamental shift that put me on the other side of an experience. Um, and I think, yeah, it was really important in building empathy and connecting. So I came back to London and I saw, I started to sort of think about service design. I started to think about how could I use my experience um, to help make things better for people. And I came across this role as a Macmillan patient experience and user involvement lead. And I thought, that's great. I'm going to do co-production and co-design and be the service designer I want to be. I started a master's. I was like ready to sort of change the world. But I think the thing that I came across when I was part of the NHS was very much um, that the way that it works is that we're all kind of trying to hold the system up and stop it from failing. And we're really busy just doing this. And sometimes we're pushing against each other and it it's, takes so much momentum to keep things going within the NHS that sometimes it's quite difficult to be transformational or have this change or work with patients in the way sometimes we'd like to. So I'd like to introduce you to business as usual with COVID masks. Um, so essentially every year um, there's, a, there's a need for patient information and the best format we have for that currently that exists still even to this day is leaflets. So you'll get an, a sort of top down thing about patient information. And then what will happen is a nurse who maybe doesn't have design skills, doesn't really do graphic design will be charged with, you know, getting some patients together and really kind of like reviewing this leaflet and making it the best leaflet it can be. So the question becomes, do you like it? Does it make sense? You might sense check it with patients and you'll get people in or now probably via email, you'll get whoever you can and you'll try and find the right people to review it. But the thing is, there's a time pressure on this and you need to get it done. And so what ends up happening inevitably is we've made the best leaflet we could make it's not really addressing the underlying needs of the patient. And we didn't have really the space or room to go there. So we did the best we could. And the issue with this is that ultimately the system then produces a result that doesn't necessarily lead to a really great patient experience or improved satisfaction with the service. Um, we've made the leaflet, the goal has been achieved, but have we actually done something that really has an impact. So we all know the answer to the question and the answer is the ideal state is putting the patient in the center of everything we do and trying to make these meaningful opportunities to exist for them so that we're able to kind of work with them and really work together to create this change. So why or what sort of stops it from happening like I know people really want to and the desire is there and everyone's doing the best they can. So one of the issues is that patient X needs to fit inside our NHS box. And by that, I'm talking about a system. I'm not even just talking about, you know, the structures we have in place, the things that kind of are holding people and the roles that we've created for patients. So if something is running from nine to five, that might be difficult for someone else to get to. We may have another opportunity on a project, but it's very much measured by what, what we get told to do and what a patient needs to sort of fit into and we try our best to make that work. So when it came to staff and people wanting to do beyond just getting feedback to actually do co-production, they'd say, it's a good idea. We should, I certainly would like to do it, but I couldn't do it right now. And that was, you know, due to a lack of time, skills, confidence, lots of things, just not having had that input and training. So my question became, how might we support better collaboration between staff and cancer patients? And I really thought this was quite radical and I wanted to be a revolutionary. 
So my question became, how can you start a revolution on the inside? And it was by doing things like believing that each project I did had to sort of be a mini revolution and had to bring people along and really kind of involve them as much as possible in that process um, in order to get their trust and in order to sort of try something different, which wasn't currently happening. And my secret weapon in the fight is Emma and patients like Emma, who was a cancer patient, is a cancer patient, user researcher, and in my opinion, an all-round superhero. So um, Emma had, I'm, I'm just going to go to my other screen because basically Emma reflected on some of her, on some of her journey, and I think that's really important. Um, so I'm going to quote Emma when I'm reading this out because these are her words. I think they're important. I'd never done anything like it before or worked in the NHS in any capacity. I was hearing about acronyms, steering groups and boards that I hadn't the foggiest and would just nod along. So it was quite nerve wracking, but also exciting, especially watching the map go from a template to a real thing and slowly fill up. Describing it to patients and their support net systems as a means of getting direct feedback and improving involvement of young people was what convinced those who were unsure to take a look and give their feedback. It showed me just how much people wanted to help the NHS and future patients. Finding out that I was one of them had a similar effect on encouraging them to take part. So on reflection, um, Emma did begin the workshops feeling overwhelmed like an imposter and we did have a lot of conversations and I will say we were learning on the job. I, this role had been created as a service to be a, a sort of a user researcher specifically for her where a role did not exist and sort of trying to figure out what support was needed and the expectations was really important. Um, when doing co-design or when bringing Emma in to co-facilitate and do things, we also had to address the power dynamic. We had to talk about what I was, what she was, like what we all brought. And I think that made it easier. And she did tell me that she felt safe speaking to me about stuff because in a way I had that lived experience. So it, she could feel like I would get it if she said she was tired because we both knew what chemo tired meant. So I'm going to talk through some strategies that worked. Um, and what I think about service design tools and the magic that they can actually help create in terms of flattening things and helping people to get involved. So I truly believe that it's a mentality that patients are partners and patients are the boss, that if we think of people like that, we treat them with deference and we ask and we involve and we get feedback and input. Um, I there were some examples of this through things we did. So at one point I was working with a patient who could no longer communicate, but was so involved in the project and it was his lifeline. So what we did when we were creating this toolkit for the service was, you know, made sure I had a weekly catch up with him. We had a comment section in a Google slide that we did together. And I always made sure that I brought him in and kept involving him in whatever capacity he could be. Um, the other part of that is something I started doing with around patient transcripts called IPA, which is interpretive phenomenological anal analysis, not a beer. So basically IPA is great because what you do is you look at a transcript that you've got and I would give it back to patients. And I'd say, is there anything missing from this story? Did I get it down right? Is this what you do? And something really powerful started happening when people were reading their stories and giving me feedback, actually, no, Sarah, I think this is the main point that was really important to me in all of this, or it was really amazing reading myself back in this way. It felt really powerful, like people could put something in a place. Um, always bring patience into the room. So video is really important, especially now in times of COVID. Um, it's so important to just make sure that the patient can always be there. Even if they can't physically be there, you can bring them in. Discovery workshops, I said, co-design them, deliver them with patients alongside you, um, give people the chance to lead. And also really important for siloed organisations is to map out an entire journey, which people don't only know their section of the journey and they don't often know what those problems are. And it's great when patients and staff both see 
sort of similar experiences or similar needs. It's really great for collaboration. So in the end, what came out of this was our patient collaboration toolkit. Um, which we created and put up on the NHS system so it can be accessed and used by other NHS patient involvement teams. And what's great is it's in a language and a way and was co-designed with staff and patients. So it makes sense to them and can be changed and altered by others. And finally, I ask that you all maybe get rid of the box altogether. Like my dream for this future in terms of sparking change is that, you know, we move from assets to action and that we become revolutionaries and find ways to remove these boxes because that is the way the system will change. And I, I really believe that's how we move forward and finally how we spark change. Thank you. That's for later. Thank you, uh, Sarah. That was uh, really interesting and look forward to asking you questions about this uh, in the Q&A.